I have the great pleasure today to speak to Joshua Sheets of the podcast Radical Personal Finance. Joshua was a well-licensed financial advisor who at one point had all kinds of titles. He chose to surrender those to create his show where he then became able to talk about finance in a broader way, in a radical way. Joshua has been doing the podcasting thing for a long, long time. And I owe Joshua a debt of gratitude for helping me unravel many of my own assumptions about finance, investing, and indeed politics. Um, I would encourage anybody to uh, check out a show, Radical Personal Finance, and as with all pad- podcasts, subscribe, and then go back to the uh, go back to some of the beginning episodes as well. I know, for example, for me, one of my best podcasts was number four, Privacy and Psychopaths, because I wanted to talk about that, so I did it first. So definitely go back and listen to his early episodes and then start to keep a track of what he's doing currently. And so Joshua has also been a huge privacy advocate, which is why we have him here today. There's lots to talk about, but Joshua, welcome to the Watchman Privacy Podcast. How's it going? Thank you for having me on. I'm a big fan. I especially love your book. And uh, ever since I became aware of it, it has become my go-to resource to give people an introductory guide to privacy that is both uh, inspiring and goes deep enough, but is accessible for beginners. So I thank you for all the good work that you're doing. I want to see more and more people embrace uh, embrace their natural right to privacy. Excellent. And I appreciate that. I hope this is the first of many conversations that we have. And so I want to give people a taste of what you are all about um, in this uh, in this first discussion. So Josh, talk about radical personal finance a little bit. And I want to ask this question in, in this way. Looking back, when you started Radical Personal Finance in 2013, what was the vision for it and how has it evolved nine years later to what it is today? Before I started the podcast, I had spent six years working as a professional financial advisor. Before that, I was a personal finance enthusiast and I had gotten laid off from a job. And when thinking about what I wanted in my own life, I started looking at the financial services industry. And I said, hey, this would actually fit a lot of what I wanted to create in my own life, meaning that I could get away from time for money. I could build something where I had equity, where I had ongoing uh, passive income, et cetera. And so I, in 2008, I joined uh, a large insurance company and started working first as an insurance agent selling life insurance, disability income insurance, long-term care insurance, and health insurance. And then I pursued my investment work, became a financial advisor, started managing money and building my uh, my financial planning practice. Uh, along the way, as you said, I became a certified financial planner, chartered life underwriter, chartered financial consultant, and you know about four or five other industry designations. And as I was going through that process, I continued to be a consumer of personal finance advice. I used to love to listen to Dave Ramsey, right? He was very influential on me when I was in college. I got out of debt because of Dave Ramsey. I used to love listening to all these financial podcasts, but I became very frustrated with the idea that these guys were giving wrong advice. Here I was, I eventually wound up getting a master's degree in financial planning, and I would listen to what they, the advice that they would give people, and I would be frustrated driving along the road in my car wanting to say, wait, 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 what you don't understand is this. And if you understood this, then you would give more nuanced or more interesting advice in the situation that you're describing. So in 2013, I said, you know what, maybe I should start a podcast. And at first I didn't have much of a dream for it. I just said, I should start a podcast. So one day I sat down in the middle of my bed with a cheap voice recorder and I clicked record and I spoke for what ended up being about 45 minutes and I clicked stop and then I went back later and listened to it and I asked myself, would I listen to that? My answer was yes, I would listen to that. It was interesting. And so I got busy and started publishing. In fact, that first audio file is still available in the Annals of Radical Personal Finance. If you just go back in the podcast feed, you can find that it's episode one. That was my very first podcast. I quickly recorded the first 10 episodes over about uh, a three-week period and published them. And then I went to my employer and I said, hey, guys, I've started a podcast. And unfortunately, I was a financial advisor, which means that there were lots and lots of regulations that applied to me. And I had thought that I had a plan to get away from those regulations by doing the show anonymously and not saying that I was a financial advisor, but I was told in no uncertain terms by my compliance officer, either you take this off the internet or you're done. 
<laughs> at the time, my wife was pregnant with our first child, and I'd spent six years building a business, and so I took it took it off the internet. Uh, but I realized that I had really loved it, and so I needed about six months to clarify my vision, and then another six months to figure out, is there any kind of business behind it? And then I wound up leaving the financial advice industry and surrendering my licenses, as you, as you said. And then a year later, I started the show again with episode 11. And in that time, in those early days, my dream was to provide a, a one-stop shop, a complete resource to help somebody go from no financial knowledge to being a multimillionaire and very wealthy. And my dream was to provide the big picture advice as well as the technical nuts and bolts of financial planning. I had a vision of some 13-year-old kid in the hood somewhere with his $30 Android phone finding my podcast and saying, wow, Joshua's going to be my guru. He's going to teach me how to, how to get out of the hood. And so that was, that was my dream in the beginning. So I started doing that. But then I woke up after a year or so of podcasting and I started surveying my audience and I found out that I didn't have any 13-year-olds listening to me and that my audience was actually quite wealthy. And in hindsight, I came to understand that. Because I realized I'm not so skilled at speaking on a basic level. My, my stuff is pretty high level. It's pretty involved. And so my audience is largely made up of highly educated, high income earners, very wealthy people who are interested in more advanced concepts. And what changed was over time, I realized that what was more lacking is not the nuts and bolts of, of how to make money, which of course, I do still cover, but more a sense of seeing how money fits into your overall life experience. And of course, I'm from the United States. And in the United States, we live in a very wealthy culture, but often we get money and wealth out of whack in terms of what it means to our, to our uh, lifestyles. And we start to look to things that are the wrong things for solutions. Uh, so we try to say, well, how can I make as much money as possible? neglecting the fact that money is simply a tool to give us a lifestyle that we wish to have. Or some people say, how can I accumulate as much money as possible so I can quit working? And then I started to draw on my hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of clients and client meetings that I had had, which showed me that the wealthiest people actually never retire. And the people who are most anxious to retire often don't actually ever become wealthy. And so the show transformed over time into a much more philosophical show where we talk about life and how it intersects with money and how we can build financial freedom very quickly, but yet keep finances in their proper role in our lives. Excellent. Why don't you give us just a taste of the radical side of the show? What are a couple of the mainstream opinions about finance that you have challenged over the years? Let's go with three. So I think the first thing is simply this. I believe that before you build a plan to try to accumulate wealth and retire, which is where most financial planning starts, you should start by building a life that you don't want to retire from. When I reflected on my years as a professional financial advisor, I realized that I had spent massive amounts of time trying to help people retire. And it's a lot simpler to simply redesign your life and reorganize your activities and build a life that you don't want to retire from. And so, for example, I developed uh, my approach into saying that there are three questions that you always wanna answer before you ever do a formal financial plan, because these are the three questions that will actually drive the substance of your life. And they're more important than what kind of insurance policy do you have or how much money do you put in your 401k? Those questions are, who do you live with? Where do you live? And what do you do every day? And what's remarkable is when I was a financial advisor, I'd have people come in and say, I don't like my job. And we'd sit down and we'd make this plan for them to save millions of dollars. In hindsight, what they should have just simply done is taken some money and done whatever was necessary in terms of money or activities to go and get a job that they liked better. So that's been perhaps the biggest one. I think the second area where my advice goes against a lot of mainstream financial advice is the value of focusing on yourself and investing into yourself before you go to the market and start buying financial products. 
So if you look at the people who are the most productive and the wealthiest, you'll see that what they generally do is invest into themselves. Sometimes that means, uh, for example, the, when I did retirement planning, the only people who ever wind up actually being able to retire comfortably either had a high income or they had a productive business that grew in value. There are a few exceptions to this, especially in the world of uh, extreme early retirement people, people who are very frugal, but that's a tiny minority and it really is a statistical blip. Most people who retire build a high income or they develop a large business. And we know that intuitively. This is why we encourage people go to college, get a degree so you can get a good job. We know that the data is there to support that. But what happens is people forget that. And so they might originally say, I'm going to go get a college degree so I can get a better job. But then they immediately turn around and start putting all their money into their retirement account and they stop developing themselves. And so I'm a big proponent of focusing on developing yourself consistently along the way. And I think perhaps the third approach that I take, the third area that is uh, different than most mainstream advice, is I look for ways to change the game by living radically. And so if you look at the, 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 the concepts of finance, right? I teach this thing called the framework of wealth, where we systematically go through and I say, here are the only things that you can do. Uh, to change your wealth. You can increase your income, you can decrease your expenses, you can invest wisely, you can avoid catastrophe, and you can optimize lifestyle. If you go through and you look at how can I do this radically, then you can make progress very, very quickly. And so on the income side of things, sometimes that means having the courage and encouraging people to have the courage to go for it at an early age. One of my regrets of when I was younger is I was too conservative. And so I frequently encourage people to recognize that most of the things that they're afraid of are really fake. They don't, the fears are not actually things that you should be afraid of. And so you should go for it. Uh, you should go for it when you're 20 years old. You should go for it when you're 50 years old. Uh, conservatism has some value, but more important is going for it and trying to change the income side dramatically. Or on the expense side, I've talked about living in your car, um, living in a tent in the woods, uh, Cutting your your taxes to zero so that you can save all kinds of money by going abroad, things like that. And then when it comes to investments, I encourage people to take a broad approach to investments. One of my frustrations is that when I say to somebody, oh, you should invest money, we who are in the financial services industry or who have been in that industry, we have successfully conditioned an entire culture to automatically associate the word investment with a mutual fund or a 401k. And yet that's just scratching the surface of the things that you could invest in. And so I encourage people to think more broadly and to analyze the opportunities that are in front of them rather than just going down the path that, that the financial services industry has trained us to go down, which is to assume that we need to be buying financial products to accomplish these these goals. Financial products are great. They're, we, I'm, I'm a big fan of some of the wonderful modern products that we've developed because they solve big problems. But financial products are often gonna keep you on the slow path to wealth rather than on the fast track. I was thinking about the imprint that your show has had on my own thinking. Just yesterday, I recall, I somehow ended up on a part of Amazon where somebody was selling for $30 these rubber duckies with video game characters uh, basically put on top of them. So they were they were rubber ducky video game characters. And this person was selling them for $30. And I was thinking about how most people, they wake up and they say, I need to find a job today, right? I need, I need a job. But there are other people like this person, and it's probably just a person or a few people selling these rubber duckies. And there were hundreds of reviews, which means that they're bringing in a bank have broken the mold and they're probably sipping pina coladas if they want in Acapulco, Mexico, while they're selling the stuff on Amazon. And so as I see all these examples of people, people just need a way to uh, accumulate money. And there are all kinds of ways of doing that. And the ways that they'll tell you on the Motley Fool or what have you are one way, but they're certainly not the only way. And so um, I, I thank you uh, for kind of opening my mind uh, in, in your myriad examples throughout the years of of ways to ways to accumulate wealth. But 
let me get a Bitcoin plug in here real quick. And I, I want to get your thoughts on Bitcoin. So the obvious connection between you and me is that we co-produced a Bitcoin privacy course. Uh, and you can find out more about it at BitcoinPrivacyCourse.com. By the way, you, the audience, when you hear this episode, we will have released the revised version. It's cleaned up. There's a full text document accompanying it. We have added material, um, added some production value. I go as far to say that it, it is probably twice the product that it was previously, maybe more. Uh, if you've already purchased the course, you'll have access to the revised one. And the course is a step-by-step -step tutorial on how to use Bitcoin properly and privately. On that topic, I wanted to ask you about Bitcoin, certainly a topic for radical personal finance. You have recently said that you were wrong about Bitcoin in the past and have come out in support of it. And that's part of the reason for us doing the course. What were your concerns about Bitcoin and how have those concerns been assuaged these days? I had several concerns about Bitcoin. And as you said, I, I did a whole episode of my podcast wherein I said I was wrong about Bitcoin and I apologize to my audience. In fact, it's interesting. I, 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 I refer to myself as a financial advisor, but technically the word financial advisor usually means some kind of licensed capacity. Uh, and so I'm no longer licensed, but I still, of course, talk about money. And I've made the comment that any financial advisor who didn't recommend to his clients that they buy Bitcoin has committed an egregious error. Because if you go back and you reflect on the growth and the value of Bitcoin over the last decade, uh, it's clearly been spectacular. And yet there are so many mainstream financial advisors who continue, as I did, to uh, to say that, uh, to, to not even talk about it. And so if your financial advisor hasn't recommended to you to buy Bitcoin, you should ask a question as to why. And, and to be clear, I think there are good reasons for some people not to buy Bitcoin and a good reason not to have all your money in Bitcoin. But at the end of the day, there have been a lot of us who were late to the party, and I was one of that. And so if you're interested in the long version, I, there's a whole episode of my podcast where I talk about it. Some of my concerns about Bitcoin have primarily been uh, were at the time. So in the, from an investment perspective, I saw at that point and still still believe that Bitcoin is properly labeled as a speculation. What I mean is there's really I haven't come up with a way that I believe is the right way to value something like Bitcoin any more than I can value any other currency by that's created by a sovereign nation any other fiat currency and this is a fundamental difference between something that's an investment versus something that is a speculation traditionally when we talk about an investment the basic theory that we use to value an investment for example let's say we're going to go and buy shares of a company buy stocks try to anticipate and forecast the cash flows the revenue that's going to be created by that company and then we try to discount that to today and we try to believe and we believe that, hey, if you buy shares of Coca-Cola Corporation, you are you're going to value those shares because here is how much we think the future revenue of Coca-Cola Corporation is going to be. And this is, of course, why when you get a good earnings report, generally you'll see an increase in stock value. When you get a bad earnings report, you'll see a decrease in stock value because we have some metric that we're that we're using to say that. Uh, that here's our discounted cash flows analysis. Now, there are other arguments. There are many ways to, to trade, but when you talk about investments, you're trying to figure out here's what the value of it is. Let's use a real estate as an example. If you see that the house next door to you is for sale, then you go and look at the house and you say, I could buy this house and I could rent it out. And my rents that I would receive for the house are you know, $1,500 a month. My costs for maintaining the house are X number of dollars per month. And so therefore, I'm going to value the house at this amount of money. And you figure it out based upon cash flows and discounted uh, discounted uh, cash flows in the future. That's how we so we can get to some sense of what this should be worth. But Bitcoin has no cash flow, cash flow. It has no um, it has no revenues. There's no there's no company behind it. It's a, a computer token. It's a piece of software. There's no actual value in it in terms of something that we could sell. It relies for its value exclusively based on demand, and that's difficult to predict. How do you predict supply and demand? 
So when you get into something that is a speculation, something that's hard to value, and when you're telling other people what to do with their money, that's difficult to know what to do, which is why most financial advisors will not encourage people to speculate. We don't. It's a big responsibility to say to somebody, oh, you should go and do it. You should go and spend your money on this certain thing over here. We know that people speculate all the time and make money. That speculation can occur with a land speculation. I'm going to go and buy this piece of land, speculating that the company, that the, the, the city is going to uh, put a highway in through here and it's going to be more valuable. We can go and speculate. Uh, we can go and gamble. There are many kinds of speculation and sometimes they turn out. But it's hard to give advice on speculation. So it was my training as a financial advisor that made me very slow to want to be involved with speculation. Fast forward, how do we actually value Bitcoin? Well, if it functions as a currency, then the value is going to be based upon the supply and demand. I mentioned that we wouldn't know how to value Bitcoin any more than we would know how to value, say, what the yen should be worth. Uh, the Japanese yen is clearly a useful currency that is used. And yet we don't have any concept of how that should relate to the dollar, the value of a dollar other than historical patterns. And so Bitcoin was, of course, extremely new just over a decade now since the white paper was originally published. Uh, and then you have to say, well, what's the usefulness of this? Bitcoin was famously not particularly useful for quite a long time because um, there were not that many people willing to accept it. And so you had this, this speculative fervor that developed around Bitcoin. And I was always bothered by the fact that people said, oh, Bitcoin is a currency, and yet Bitcoin's value does not operate like a currency. It was so, there was had such a massive increase in value that everybody was it seemed like everyone was buying it, not to use it, not to trade it, not to buy it and sell it, but just simply to hold on, hoping it goes up more. And so through that lens, Bitcoin looks very much like a Ponzi scheme. It looks like a confidence game. And the idea is I'm going to buy Bitcoin at $1,000 a coin. And then if more people want my Bitcoin, then if I can get, convince more people to get into it, then I could sell my Bitcoin at $15,000 a coin. That's a, that's a confidence game. That's a, that's a Ponzi scheme where something has to increase in demand in order for it to go up. And that's what's difficult about, uh, about Bitcoin. And that was, those are the reservations I had. I was like, it can't be a currency when it's fluctuating around so wildly. No, none of us will stand for a currency that drops 50% of its value. We understand that that can happen with an investment, uh, some investments, but we're not going to stand for that for a currency. There needs to be stability and people need to trade it. People need to to actually use it. And it, years ago, those the ability to use it was quite diminished. What changed my mind, though, was over time, I looked at it and I said, wait a second, why does it have to be that way? So, for example, the the, the volatility. I asked myself this question. I said, why is it that a currency can't go up in value? Why, why should a currency not go up in value? And perhaps the dramatic increases in the value of Bitcoin were actually the secret to its success. Uh, I think Satoshi, there's a quote in his original writings where he said that in a decade, Bitcoin will either be worth nothing or it'll be worth a lot. And I think there was something very prescient about that because it's really, in many ways, a binary game. Either it's not worth anything or it's worth potentially a lot. Because, And so what happened is the dramatic increases in the value brought a lot of attention to Bitcoin. And I think that a lot of people who started to get involved speculating on Bitcoin, buying it exclusively because they hoped it would increase dramatically in value, that brought more exposure to Bitcoin. And as Bitcoin got more exposure, more people used it. And then as more people bought it, they started to see the usefulness of it. And it became, and it has, I think it has changed in nature to actually be more useful because more and more people are, um, are, are involved, are using it. I now am quite bullish on the future of Bitcoin and I'm not predicting price value. I'm bullish on the widespread use of Bitcoin because more and more people are are, are actually using it. Um, I accept Bitcoin uh, as payment for products and services at times. I have used Bitcoin as a mode of payment for products and services. 
I have used it as something genuinely useful. And I think that there are millions and millions of people who have done that and who will do that. And it will happen. And so the increase in value, what I used to th- meaning that the fluctuations, what I used to think were a major bug, now I look at it and say maybe it would never have succeeded if that didn't happen. Uh, and so that was a, a, an argument where I, I was in error. In addition, I'm so excited to see people embracing Bitcoin from an ideological perspective. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was in Miami for the Bitcoin 2022 conference. Huge conference. I think they had 25,000 attendees. It was massive. Um, and what one of the takeaways that I took from, from that experience, being in a room with thousands and thousands of Bitcoin devotees, was that many of them were ideologically driven. Many of them were ideologically driven to have the people's money, to have a form of, of, of accounting, have a form of transfer of value that wasn't driven by governments who have a monopoly on violence, that wasn't driven by, by governments who capriciously use their m- monopoly authority on money supply to give themselves more spending power when they think it's convenient to do so. And so now I look at it and I think we've got such tremendous usefulness now. Uh, another thing that really impressed me from the conference was that I don't see any major problems with with Bitcoin that haven't been solved or aren't being solved and actively worked on by some of the smartest people in the world. Uh, and so it's really, 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 really useful um, in, in terms of people's ability to use it. And I'll just one more experience that that did impact me. Uh, from a privacy perspective, uh, which is kind of a separate argument from privacy perspective, I've been a very light user of a lot of the electronic payment uh, options. I wasn't an early adopter of Apple Pay. I wasn't an early ad- I, I In fact, in 2018, I did a personal experiment where I I wanted to see if the war on cash really existed. And so in 2018, I made my very best effort to spend an entire year living exclusively uh, on physical currency. And uh, I, I tried to get paid in currency. I tried to make all my payments across the board 100% in currency. I tried to uh, see what it was like dealing with currency, physical dollar bills in and out of the bank, et cetera. Uh, and that may be an interesting thing for us to comment, to talk about in a moment from a privacy perspective. But after that, uh, so I was, I just wasn't using a lot of electronic payments. In 2019, though, I started, um, I started traveling the world. And among other things, one of the things I finally got around to doing was I got around to actually starting to use Apple Pay. Uh, And of course, I had my credit cards and Apple Pay. And I started using Apple Pay on my watch. And as I traveled the world, I was in uh, a dozen countries. I realized that because of my personal financial infrastructure, meaning that I use a number of credit cards internationally that have zero international transaction fees, and my credit card company just simply uh, convert does the conversion for me for the local currency. And when I got outside the United States and I saw how much more widespread internationally um, things like touchless auto, uh, touchless uh, electronic payment is, even in the United States, it's much more prevalent in most of the world than it is in the United States. That's changing now. I've noticed the last few times I've been in the U.S. that's changing. But in 2019, it was pretty rare that you would go into many stores in the United States and have a contactless transaction option where you just wave your card or, or use Apple Pay or Google Pay or whatever you, you use. Whereas around the world, that was the standard technology. So I started using just Apple Pay on my watch. And as I'm engaging in all these transactions, I realized I pay zero attention to what the local currency is. I don't care. It doesn't matter whether it's a peso or whether it's a euro or whatever. I just I don't I don't care. I just click the button on my watch, pay the transaction and move on with my life. And I thought to myself, here I have set up on my watch. I have 10 credit cards that I can access. I don't care what the local currency is. Now, all of a sudden, it makes just as much sense for me to pay with Bitcoin than it does with anything uh, with dollars. And especially now that we have uh, Bitcoin linked debit cards, et cetera, which make it really, really convenient, I can buy and, se- and, and sell my Bitcoin and pay for stuff with Bitcoin completely as seamlessly as I can with dollars. And so that for me was the last uh, kind of the tipping point personal experience where I realized I actually believe now 
that Bitcoin could be used as a medium of exchange and it could be just as convenient for me as uh, as anything else. Um, and so now that's a little different than dealing in the world of, of wallet IDs and, and QR codes, et cetera. But seeing that when I finally got my first Bitcoin link debit card and got it signed up with Apple Pay, it was an acknowledgement to me saying that, you know what, this can work. So most of my questions have been resolved. Um, I stopped being conservative. I stopped being so concerned with it. And I became much more invested into the concept of having uh, of having a non-state-backed currency that could actually work. And this is fundamentally new. I have for years believed that there should be open competition of currencies. That's one of the, the hallmarks of the uh, Austrian School of Economics, which I admire. And basically many Austrian ec economists would say, you should be able to compete with your currency against another currency. And we see that happening. But most of us have been indoctrinated into believing that it's only a sovereign government that can create a currency. And there have been limitations to other currencies, especially in the physical world. But Bitcoin provides a really neat opportunity to bypass that, to surpass that. And so I've embraced it and I've realized, no, this can actually work. And now one more comment. The other, the other major problem with Bitcoin has been uh, – that you always had to have an on-ramp into Bitcoin from a fiat currency, and you always had to have an off-ramp from Bitcoin into a fiat currency. I think this is still a hindrance to Bitcoin. You'll see that people usually refer to the value of Bitcoin based upon a well-known currency, right? Bitcoin is $40,000, and so they're automatically associating the dollar as the reserve of value rather than the Bitcoin as the reserve of value. And so I don't think that we're all the way there yet, but I do think that in the future that can change and people can more and more start to measure things just in terms of, hey, this is a Satoshi. This is something that is genuinely um, genuinely a fixed value. And now that people can transact directly, Bitcoin to Bitcoin, and now that you can spend Bitcoin directly without having to have so many off ramps into a fiat currency, it seems like, um, it seems like we've solved a lot of those problems. And so uh, it takes time, as it always did, as it always, it has taken me time. But uh, while I'm not a Bitcoin maximalist uh, in the sense of saying it's Bitcoin only, and while I'm not a Bitcoin maximalist in terms of saying you should put all your money into Bitcoin, um, I do now believe that this system can work. And I'm excited to, I want to promote it ideologically because I want to have a genuinely peaceful currency. I want to see the the governments of the world that depend on their currency manipulation for power and commit violence against other persons. I want to see them have less power and I want to see people have uh, a, a form of money, a, 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 a way to store accounts and way to measure transactions that can't be screwed with by politicians and unelected bureaucrats in, in secret boardrooms. Uh, it's, it's so... I want to see it happen, and I want to encourage that process. Well, you covered a lot there, Josh, and I don't know that I can add anything except to encourage people. BitcoinPrivacyCourse.com if you want to get started in the best and the proper way. And those proceeds go to supporting uh, myself and Radical Personal Finance. And Josh, I'm curious about the year. I forgot about this year that you spent only using cash. Uh, that's would be very valuable for our audience, I think. I try to use cash for everything. Uh, obviously, online transactions are a small problem <laughs> or a big problem. And when I go around using cash these days, I notice that uh, people look at it quite suspiciously or they <laughs> kind of hold it as if it was a uh, contaminated piece of paper. Um, I get uh, weird, weird looks for, for using cash. People are not comfortable with it anymore. Tell me, though, about this year. It was more just a, a little hobby. I, I and I'll, I'll tell you how, why I, I got into it. Over the years, I've been on various bandwagons where I accepted what other people said. And then I might later turned out and I said, you know, it's not so true. And I'm pretty good at seeing multiple sides of most arguments. And it always bothered me, the concept of the so-called war on cash, because I thought, yeah, that's probably true. 
there probably is a war on cash, but it, but the people who say that the government is imposing the war on you and they're trying to eliminate your privacy and whatnot, I often found myself skeptical. My primary reason for skepticism, by the way, against that argument is simply that the move from physical currency to digital transactions linked to an electro- a credit card or a debit card, that's been a a voluntary move that people have made because it makes their life better. When people started using their Amex for everything or their debit card for anything, they chose to do that, not because they were coerced to do it, but because they they felt it made their life better, whether it was they did had less of a theft risk of people stealing their cash or losing their cash, whether they were less concerned about uh, fraudulent transactions. They chose that voluntarily because they believed it made their life better. Merchants chose to allow people to buy and sell with credit cards, uh, even at low dollar limits, because it made their life better. Years ago, when I first graduated college, I worked for a time for a marketing consulting company, and we did a project for Burger King. And I remember talking at that time, looking at some of the data as to why in, in that era, Uh, the fast food restaurants had removed their minimum transaction requirement. And it was simply that people spent more money that they would, if they accepted credit cards for a 99 cent purchase, what would happen is somebody paying with a dollar bill would just buy something for 99 cents. Whereas somebody paying with a credit card would go ahead and add something else and they would have $3 and 15 cent transaction um, amount. And so they, so McDonald's chose to accept Uh, credit cards for small things. It it was all voluntary. And so I was always skeptical of the idea that this is some kind of nefarious plot that that those guys or the the, the powerful secret elite are foisting on the people. So I thought, let me try it. Let me see if I can live on cash. And what I discovered is that it's virtually impossible to do. And I went as far as I could. First of all, um, I couldn't get all of my payments in cash, although I tried. I I had clients and I had them mail me cash in the mail. And it was overall a successful thing, right? I had read JJ Luna's books on uh, on how to how to do mail transaction with cash, and I had lots of people that would send me cash in the mail and it worked out fine uh, most of the time. But then it was a hassle, right? It was an accounting hassle. It was a hassle. You're always concerned about theft even though the the mail was pretty reliable. But I tried to get as much of my my money in in cash as possible. Then I went out and I tried to spend it in cash, tried to pay my bills in cash. And there are some people who were happy to do it, right? My landlord was happy to be paid in cash, didn't didn't have any problem with that. But all of a sudden, you want to pay your mortgage payment in cash, you can't do it. You can't mail them. So you have to go and you have to get uh, a money order or you have to get some some form of that. So I would go and to the post office and try to get money orders. Oh, wait a second. Maximum, I think it's $4,000 is the maximum money order that you can do. And for no ID requirements, I think it's $2,000. I had people send me money orders. And I, I remember this time, people who were uncomfortable sending me cash for, for payments and for transactions, I had them send me postal money orders. So I would go and take those postal money orders. And I quickly learned you can't actually cash a postal money order at a post office. Why? Because it's Because they won't do it? Well, it's it's not that, th- that it's illegal for them to do it. It's that they don't have the money. I remember one time I had, I think it was just a thousand bucks, right? Not a big deal. Not a lot of money or, or maybe even two. It's been a few years now. But I remember I, I went to the post office, to several post offices trying to cash these money orders and they just didn't have enough money in the drawer. And they tell me, come back at the end of the day. And you, you have to come back at four o'clock in the end of the day rush before they finally have enough money in the drawer to give it to you. So the concept of even a money order being a useful thing and some form of private money was a major hassle. I would go and try to pay the utilities, and I did that. Uh, and so I would I could use cash a lot of times, but when you try to go to any kind of normal size transaction, uh, meaning it's it's fine to pay cash when you go to a restaurant, it's fine to pay cash for those kinds of things, but for any normal size transaction of life, a rent payment, a, a mortgage payment, et cetera, you can't do it. And so I started digging into it. And what I realized was that the war on cash was actually started institutionally, and it was largely based upon inflation. So a little bit of history for you. In the United States, the largest bill that was ever issued for public use was a $10,000 bill. 
Uh, there were higher denominations that were created that you can find. They're pretty cool when you go and, and find those. But those were exclusively used for bank transfers. The largest bill that was ever created and printed for public use was a $10,000 bill. Um, the last of those bills was printed in 1945. What's that? 80 plus years ago or about 80 years ago. And then in 1969, all of those large bills were retired. Since 1969, the largest bill that you were able to get is the $100 bill. But what's happened is, back to monetary theory, because the U.S. dollar is an inflationary currency by design, we've had inflation. And that was never indexed for inflation. So if you do an inflation calculation from 1969 to today, you'll find that a $100 item that you would have purchased in 1969 was worth more than $700 today. I don't have the 2022 numbers. In my notes, I have 2019 dollars. So I'll just use that. In 2019, it's worse now. 1969, $100 item was uh, would have been today's dollar, $685. Uh, or the flip side, a $100 item purchased in 2019 would only cost you $14.58 in 1969 dollars. So when they froze that, in 1969, a $100 bill was a genuinely useful sum of money. Today, a $100 bill is is a very is not a particularly useful sum of money. Um, it's not, not nothing to sneeze at, right? We all accept $100 bills, but at the end of the day, it doesn't buy all that much, and that was by design. And um, and I'm not aware of any any push in the U.S. government to issue a larger denomination of currency. If anything, the trend is the other way. Uh, the 500 euro note in Europe has been retired. Uh, there are still a couple of notes. You can still get a thousand Swiss franc note, but due to the war on money laundering and drugs and violence and terrorism and all that, all these countries have said, oh, we're, we're getting rid of our big denomination notes. Another example of this structural war on cash is the currency transaction reports. In the United States, anytime you do a cash-to-cash -cash transaction through an institution or a business of more than $10,000, then that business is supposed to create a currency transaction report, which gets filed with FinCEN. That $10,000, though, was set in 1970, and it was not indexed for inflation. Again, between 1970 and 2019, in 1970, a $10,000 item was $65,000 and $2019. Or flipping it around, a $10,000 item in 2019 was a $1,500 item in 1970 dollars. And so what you see is that whether it was by design or simply chance, there is a war on cash and it's become virtually impossible to live in or do business in cash in the United States due to these structural scenarios. So then when you then, in addition to that, add on all of the legislation that changed after 2001, with the Patriot Act and everything, and you get your FBARs and your FATCA, uh, we'll get to FATCA in a moment, um, it became so difficult to even open a bank account, multiple forms of ID, social security number required, et cetera, that banking became unlike it. And what you need to recognize, I say this frequently, it's important to remember, especially in privacy conversations, Every single person who works in the financial system in the United States in any way, be that your friendly local banker at your local branch, be that your uh, insurance agent or your financial advisor who trades your stocks, be it your the guy who works at the counter at your local grocery store, you know, giving you money orders. Every single one of those people is an unpaid spy for the U.S. government. When I was a financial advisor, I was required every year to take training on how to be an unpaid spy for the U.S. government. They call it, of course, anti-money laundering training. And they're required to sit through in our annual trainings um, a couple of hours of instruction on here's how you find people who are laundering money, et cetera. And this is all under the guise of terrorism and, and all the rest. And so you're dealing with a system that is designed to take away privacy. And over the last 20 years, there's been a massive move in that. So clearly the Patriot Act was a major, major component of that. You have a piece of legislation that was written long before 2001, but yet, hey, here's the chance to go ahead and bring this in under the guise of the, the anti-terrorist um, furor of the time. Uh, you had the FATCA, the Foreign Account uh, tax Compliance Act that was passed, uh, was that 2000, about a decade ago? That has fundamentally upended and revolutionized all global banking. The United States now requires 
every bank in every country in the world that does any business with U.S. persons to make an annual report to the U.S. government of all of, of the transactions, the the balance of amount, et cetera, of the uh, of the banking activity of U.S. persons. If they don't do that, they face unbelievably punitive fines, which is why when FATCA first came out, Americans around the world found themselves debanked. Um, interesting follow-on then was the enactment of the CRS standard, the Common Reporting Standards, which has now become a global phenomenon that virtually all major countries of the world now have said, hey, by the way, the U.S. is the United States is so good at that. Let's all build another similar system and let's all send each other banking information so we all know where your citizens are or where your taxpayers are in the world and what they have in their uh, in their accounts. And so massive amounts of data on your activities is systematically reported to government officials, uh, officials all around the world. And this is a major, major risk. This is a massive problem on a global basis. Um, people who are Americans or primarily from the United States don't often understand the, pri the risk of this. Uh, because generally, we've been blessed as Americans to live in a, a pretty decent society, pretty decent uh, level of safety. Uh, we could pretty much do what we want. There's a very high uh, legal standard of privacy for bankers in terms of personal financial information, and it's actually enforced in the United States. Interesting little component. Um, Gabriel, you probably know, so I won't ask as a rhetorical question, but there's one major country in the world that does not participate in CRS. That country is the United States. So the United States has a system called FATCA where they require every other country in the world to report to the United States uh, the financial accounts, et cetera, of U.S. persons. But then the rest of the world said we're going to build CRS and the United States refuses to participate, which is why the United States is one of the world's greatest um, tax havens and banking havens for secret banking um, in the world. And it is by design. It's not by accident. So back to the point. People often conceive, especially in, the, in um, your audience, of course, is, is, understands privacy, but, but people say, well, why is this a big deal? Well, I remember a number of years ago, I was chatting with a friend of mine from Mexico, and his comment was this. He's like, I don't bank in Mexico. Well, why don't you bank in Mexico? You're a Mexican. He said, what happens where I live is the local cartels, which have tremendous amounts of power and tremendous amounts of money fueled by the drug, the drug business, they pay the informants inside of the bank to tell them about uh, the account balances. And so let's say that Gabriel has, you know, uh, let's say that Gabriel has an eight-year-old daughter and we can go to Gabriel's bank and we just pay some low-level clerk to tell us that Gabriel has $100,000 uh, in his bank account. Well, now we're going to go and kid kidnap Gabriel's daughter and we're going to send him a ransom demand for $100,000. Do you think Gabriel's going to pay that? He's absolutely going to pay that because there, if he doesn't, his, he will absolutely be receiving the dismembered body parts of his daughter. Like it's not a game. It, that's what happens. And so you'll pay the hundred thousand dollars to get it back. The only way you protect yourself in a situation like that is privacy. Um, recently, I was uh, inspired uh, again on this subject. I was listening to uh, uh, offshore citizen Michael Michael Rosmer who does the great, has a great YouTube channel called Offshore Citizen. He was talking about the privacy uh, concerns of financial accounts when getting uh, offshore residence permits. Uh, and so this is, this is a big deal. So as, as, as an example of how it functions, right? You go to a country, you know, any, any number of countries, and you say, I'd like to apply for a residence permit in this country. One of the common requirements of a residency application is disclosure of your financial affairs. You need to tell them how much money you have. You need to prove that you have a certain net worth. And this is some, it varies from country to country how this information is collected. But you go to the country and you say, look, I've got half a million dollars in investment accounts, or I can, I, you know, I have money here in this amount. Well, local uh, criminals will simply pay an informant in the government process for the data and simply say, tell us whenever you find someone who has a half million dollar net worth. Well, la -dee da here comes um, Gabriel with his residency application. And to get the residency, you have to prove that you have the half a million dollar net worth. Well, now we know that. And so a local criminal gang now keeps an eye out. When Gabriel shows up in the country, then we kidnap him or we kidnap a family member and we make a ransom demand. 
And so this is a common occurrence all around the world. And the the only way that you can protect against it is through financial privacy, keeping um, control over your personal affairs. And so this is one of the reasons why I am so ideologically committed to wanting to support the enhancement of the use, the use and the adoption of Bitcoin is simply that we need, we're never going back to the world of cash. That's what I learned from my year of the war on cash. We're never going back. Um, giving up the convenience of digital transactions, it was brutal. And I am far more tolerant of difficulty than a lot of people. It was really, really tough. And so we're not going back to that world. What we need is we need a new system that functions digitally and allows us to have instant digital transactions and, and, state, and, keep, and keeping accounts with one another of transactions of value, but that also has privacy baked in as uh, a feature that's either optional or part of the whole scenario. Uh, and so I learned a lot from that experiment. I'm glad I did it. And, and I basically learned that, yeah, there is a war on cash. And we're never going to go back to that world. It's simply too inconvenient. And we appreciate too much the ability to exchange value with people digitally. Obviously, a key ingredient to privacy, as you have noted in your podcast, is being rich. And I tend to agree. Um, yes, you can do a whole lot with software. But when it comes to large purchases and moving yourself abroad and acquiring more tools and setting up legal arrangements, money becomes necessary or certainly helps. Um, could you just give the audience a sense of what money can do to give one access to more tools in a privacy toolkit? Well, let's begin at low-hanging fruit. In the privacy space, there are a number of excellent techniques that you can use, for example, to keep your home address private. So those, I'm not going to go over those. That's what you do and what you teach. But you can use those techniques. But there are a number of these techniques that you can use to deal with your physical legal address. And some of these techniques are cheap, meaning, okay, I'm going to have a mail forwarding service that has, and I'm going to use this as my address. I'm going to have a, a, one of these personal mailboxes, and that's the address that I'm going to use. Thankfully, you can do this, and you can do this legally. Um, Unfortunately, even the very best solutions of doing that virtually are difficult. I had an experience. I went through the process of setting up my residency in one of the states that allows nomad residency. I did it all. I filed all the paperwork, et cetera. I had it all, I had it all buttoned up. I had an address that was a virtual address on my driver's license. Everything was good until I needed um, a new bank account. So I go to the bank and I try to open a bank account. Uh, it was for a business account. And I got flagged. I got flagged because of the fact that I had a virtual address. And it turned into actually a huge night. It was a very difficult thing. I got declined for three bank accounts at three different institutions because of having that address. In addition to that, I started to have trouble with my credit cards. Um, my credit cards, I couldn't get any new credit cards and, uh, my, my existing credit cards then stopped taking my, my change of address. For example, American express, uh, refused to take ever. Most of the credit cards accepted when I had the credit card account opened. Um, and I just simply changed my address from a physical address to a virtual address. That was fine. American express would never accepted it. They would not accept it. And so they would still keep my old mailing address on, on file. And so I had moved out of that physical address. I had gone through all of the steps to privatize my information, to get a virtual address, et cetera, so that my, where I slept at night, wasn't available in the public records. And here I've got this issue where I can't even get credit cards to to update so that if I need something from them, I, I can't get it. Uh, that bank account issue was so bad, I actually had to fly to the United States um, twice because the first time I came in, um, I said, so I, I had tried to do this remotely, open an account for a new business, and I couldn't do it remotely. So I thought, no big deal. I'm going to be in the United States uh, for a trip that was previously scheduled. So I went there and I went to a local bank. I went in person. Uh, with everything. I had my passport, my driver's license, et cetera. I opened the account for the new bank. I had the EIN for the, for the new business. I had the EIN number, et cetera. I thought, finally, I got it done. And I got it done without having to um, 
with my virtual address. A day later, I get an email from the banker. Sorry, Joshua, we're not willing to uh, approve the account because you didn't pass the due diligence screening, the back office due diligence screening. I only succeeded later <laughs> when I had to make an entire separate trip to the United States exclusively for the purpose of opening a bank account. And I had to go to a completely different state where I, I was able to do it. I don't want to give too many details away, but it was a, a giant hassle. And it opened my eyes to the fact that you can do, for example, some of the address privacy stuff by tinkering around with the virtual addresses, et cetera. But the only way, in my opinion, to actually have a private address that works is to maintain an address that's a real, legit, standard, everyday address that you use for all of your business purposes. And so that's obviously expensive, right? Most people aren't going to want to go and rent an apartment or buy a house that they use for their identity needs that uh, that it, that passes all the screens. But ever since I did that, um, my life has gotten substantially easier. That instead of having a virtual address, I have an actual address. Just so happens to be that I'm there very infrequently. Then everything got better. And so that's an example of how. It's it's you can do it cheaply, but then you start running into problems. And at the end of the day, if you're wealthy and you can just keep an apartment that you rent, that's an empty apartment, uh, that is your place that is reflected on all your paperwork, your life is a lot simpler. Now, of course, there are options, right? You've got your cousin who says, yeah, go ahead. This is your address. There are some ways to do that, but it's an example. Similarly, going you know, I, I, I deal a lot with the privacy stuff. I, I talk about it in terms of offshoring. Um, a number of years ago, I realized that I could solve a lot of the concerns that I had uh, about the future by simply embracing flag theory and becoming more of a in, of an internationally diversified individual. Well, that's it works. I think one of the best ways to enjoy privacy, uh, security, a really great lifestyle is to embrace flag theory. But at its core, it's obviously going to require some more uh, resources. You either need a location-independent business or you need enough wealth that you can live on the income from your investments without having to keep a job that's a physical job in a physical location. And you need the money to go through and acquire multiple sets of paperwork, acquire residence permits, second passports. You need the money to pay for the plane tickets, pay for the multiple residences around the world. And so once you get there, everything is a lot easier, but um, but it it does it requires some resources. And so uh, there are of course excellent ways to do privacy that cost less. You don't you can be a nomad within the United States. You don't have to be an international nomad. Uh, you can get a physical address that will work even if you don't rent an apartment and keep it empty all the time. But definitely money solves a lot of problems, even just simply at the idea of being able to use attorneys to do many of your transactions for you. If you hire a privacy consultant, right, it's a lot easier if I want to buy a house, if I hire Gabriel to be my attorney to go and look at the house and negotiate it, make sure all the things done, I can protect my my identity and have Gabriel do the, the front end work for me. I can do it much easier if I can simply afford to pay you to do that service rather than my trying to figure out how to do it myself. On that topic, Joshua, somebody asked Ayn Rand once, well, Ms. Rand, what about the poor? And her response was, make sure you're not one of them. So you run a quite successful business online. What are your thoughts on the online business route as you have done it? Um, or maybe a bit of advice for people itching for self-employment and the serious privacy and freedom it can bring not to mention potential wealth if done correctly. We have been living through one of the greatest revolutions in location independence that I think has ever happened. For context, I wanted, since the time I was 15 years old, I wanted a location independent online business. It was a dream of mine. I remember I, I bought, uh, I bought when I was a teenager, I bought some ebook on like how to pick up girls or, or, or something like that. And I remember reading that and recognizing the fact that the guy who sold me that ebook was making money on the fact that I had bought his ebook on how to pick up girls. And 
he may have followed up with some online business thing at some point, but it opened my eyes and I said, wait a second, I want that. I want the ability to sit on the other side of the world and make money all around the world. And so I started pursuing it. It took me 15 years to make it happen. Uh, but today, all of the stuff that used to used to be necessary is no longer necessary. You go back to the 90s, the early 2000s, you had these ads in the back of magazines for a work from home business, stuffing envelopes or doing medical billing, et cetera. Over the last two years, that entire industry has become obsolete because remote work became the norm. Right at the very beginning of the pandemic, I recorded an episode of the podcast and I said, the single best thing that you can look forward to right now, your single biggest lifestyle opportunity improvement is to get yourself moved to remote work. And I still believe that that was true and is true. Whereas today, you no longer have to look for a an internet job. You no longer have to look for remote work. Work in mo- many industries is simply remote by definition, or it can be done remotely. So you can keep all of your existing job categorizations. You can keep your current career, and you can just negotiate an employment agreement either with your current employer or with uh, another employer and simply move it to some kind of remote work, doing what you're already doing. This is vastly easier than going into the world of how do I make money online. Uh, I believe that there are tremendous opportunities of how to make money online, but it's not easy or simple in many cases. What's the best low-hanging fruit is simply to take your job and take it remote. Years ago, uh, in about, I think it was about 2003, something like that, when Tim Ferriss published The 4-Hour Workweek, he had an entire section in that book related to how to negotiate with your employer a remote work arrangement. He had all this advice of things you should do, steps you go through, et cetera, to make it happen. I was interested. I was reading that book a couple year, a year or so ago, and I was interested in, I was noticing how it's basically obsolete because everybody can work online. And so what I would encourage people to do is not necessarily go down the internet money rabbit hole, uh, but rather to say, how can I just simply take what I'm doing now and negotiate a remote work arrangement? Because that's a big win for you in terms of lifestyle opportunities, privacy benefits. It's also a big win for your employer in many circumstances. They don't have to maintain a large office, expensive office, et cetera. And while you can't do it with all jobs or with all companies, you can do it in many, especially now in the wake of the COVID pandemic. Good advice. One thing that I recall from one of your episodes, and you said at one point that you had not really ever engaged in advertising your show. And I thought that was that was quite revelatory to me, having read all the stuff about online business and all the rest where they say you must know everything about your customers, you must uh, collect all their information, you must advertise and pay per click and advertise on Twitter and, and Facebook and all the rest. And here you were, and I know that you were running a successful business, um, you have millions of listeners over the years, and you had not done that sort of thing. Sure, you have been on other podcasts and invited people onto yours and the the way that I encountered you was you being on a privacy podcast that I was listening to. So there's certainly that. But I'm just curious if because this is one of one of my things that I bring up to people who are always talking about the need to accumulate more and more of this kind of surveillance data on their customers has. Well, let, let me just get your thoughts on that. Do you think that the we'll just call it the surveillance culture goes too far when it comes to developing a business? That's a loaded (laughs) and challenging question because... Well, maybe, let, let let me phrase it this way then. Your interest in not participating in that, have you come to regret that? Do you think that businesses can succeed and how can they succeed without kind of participating in all of that? I I do regret that. And while your assessment is correct, I did build my business with no advertising. Most listeners who arrive at Radical Personal Finance do it 
either because of simply good keyword positioning with the title personal finance. If you go to your podcast directory and you search personal finance, you will find radical personal finance. And so that was by design. I tried to choose a title that had good keyword positioning and was interesting. You might say, well, radical personal finance, that sounds interesting. And let me see what's radical about this. So that is a major component of that. If I had named my show the Joshua Sheets show, I would have no listeners ever uh, because there was no search terms associated with that. And the second thing is in word of mouth. I have always prioritized quality as best I'm able to deliver it for the benefits of my listeners. And my listeners do appreciate that. For example, when you open the show, you mentioned that there are archives of the podcast. I've worked very hard over the years to not repeat things frequently. I don't take the same content and recycle it constantly. And so there's 800 episodes of a podcast there with perhaps 50 episodes of overlap, 50 to 100 episodes of overlap among those. Uh, and a lot of those overlap episodes are specifically identified as overlap, simply me saying, hey, my thoughts have changed. I'm going to change what I've said previously, and here's why. But, so people appreciate that, and my audience likes that. And I believe that at its core, a business means find your customer and serve him. And if you can serve people effectively, people will find it. However, if I were doing it over again, I would not do it that way. It has cost me a lot of money doing it that way. And I don't believe that that was the right decision. It wasn't the right decision then, and it's not the right decision now, which is why I have systematically been changing uh, things, and I intend to change things even more going forward. So there is a bit of a – first, let me answer it on the business perspective. I like to be sold to. I like to be marketed to. I appreciate businesses that work hard to keep in touch with me. And I'm happy to give people information so that they can keep in touch with me. Um, <clears throat> recently, uh, if, you, if you add a new book, right, I'm going to buy your new book. I want to know about it. I may not listen to your podcast every week, but I want to know about it. I saw that uh, Bazell wrote a new book recently. Um, and so I immediately went and found out about it and I bought it. And so I like being on mailing lists for people that can pitch me stuff. And if I have a favorite author who writes books, I want to be on a mailing list and find out about his new book so that I can go and buy it. And then we go forward from there. I like being sold stuff that 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 fits me. Um, I actually think that algorithms and targeted sales content is a major life improvement. It's not all negative. Uh, people often say, well, the algorithm does such and such to you. And that's true, right? So for a couple of experiments that I've run, one of the things, this would be common in privacy circles, but one of the things I did for a long time was anytime I consumed video on YouTube, I consumed it in a browser and I had the browser set that when I closed the browser, it would clear the cookies in the cache and I would not use a signed in account. Um, I've done that many frequently with my primary browser. And that's useful because it gives you a very different view of the world than most people get, where when you eliminate the data that is being used to create a profile, you wind up seeing arguments more broadly than only seeing the arguments that reinforce your biases. So that's good. On the other hand, I will often train the browser to give me the content that I want. So recently, right, I recently started studying German. So one of the tips that I, tricks that I do is I go and I set up a YouTube account that is specifically my German account. And this is the account that I'm gonna use. And so what I do is I go and I start finding German videos and I train the algorithm to give me the things that I need and that I want. And now I, I make the algorithm send me more and more video, more content that's gonna help my language acquisition. And it's done very, very thoughtfully. That's a big benefit. Here's another example. You can go and you can try to buy something uh, say you're going to go and buy a car. You can go to Craigslist and you can search for a car with no algorithm. And sometimes you can find what you're looking for and sometimes what you can find what you're not looking for. Last year, I bought a car in Europe. I was not in Europe at the time. But what I did was I used the algorithm and I trained it to find me a car. I went on Facebook. I started systematically searching in Europe where I wanted to buy the country in Europe where I wanted to buy the car. And I started searching for certain kinds of cars. 
I didn't know what brand was going to meet my need because it wasn't the American brands. And so I started searching. And then I let the algorithm pitch me vehicles until I figured out the makes and models that would work for my needs. Then I continued to just let the algorithm work there, checked in on it every couple of days. And it would pitch me all these, these cars. I would add them all to my favorites, to my watch list. And then uh, two days before I was ready to fly in, I started contacting people and started setting up appointments. And I was able to find a great car that fit my needs perfectly in two days on the ground in a country where I didn't speak the language. And I did it all because I let the algorithm find the car for me. And so algorithms per se are not a not a bad thing. So from a business perspective, I don't think that business privacy or, or for example, not advertising or not marketing is something to be embraced. I think it's rather a, 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 a way of failing people, right? I, I think that I fail my clients if I don't create products that serve them and then notify them of those products. Where we get into things that are difficult is when you say, well, what about the information that is being given? So Right, Gabriel, you and I, we have dozens of email addresses. I can give somebody an email address without um, surrendering my privacy, and that can create a system that puts those email addresses specifically where I want them to be. Uh, sorry, those emails where I want them to be. And so you can create the system that, that has the stuff that you want. This is my newsletter address. This is my sales addresses, et cetera, because I want to see that information. I just want to choose it. And so what I want to avoid is I don't care what name somebody gives me. That doesn't matter to me. Um, they give me whatever the name. I don't care what email address they give me. I don't care how they pay me. I don't care about any of that stuff. I don't care about the privacy, but I do care about doing a good job of communicating with my customers. And so I don't see it as black and white as one or the other. I think that if you have something that's going to solve somebody's problem, then – well, I wouldn't say that this is a moral duty – in the same way that some other moral duties, uh, in, on the same level of some other moral duties that we have, I do believe that in, in, a, in a sense, again, maybe we call this a minor moral duty, you have a duty to create the best thing that you can and then to market it in the best way possible to solve people's problems. If you have a solution, right, if you have a privacy solution that is going to solve, let's say that you can teach somebody who's being stalked or who's in a dangerous situation and needs to disappear. You can teach that person how to do it. And you can teach that person how to do it in, um, in an effective way, a way that's actually going to solve their problems, in a way that's going to actually um, get that person to safety then I think you also have at least a minor moral duty to try to market it in the best way possible. And so if that means buying Facebook ads to stalking, then that may help save somebody's life. Right? You target someone who says, I'm being stalked, and now all of a sudden you pitch them a, a, a Facebook ad that says, here's how to disappear from a stalker, and it's, and it's your book or your course or your uh, product that teaches them, listen, step one is delete your Facebook account. Okay, great. The, go ahead and delete the Facebook account. But in the meantime, you might literally save somebody's life in that scenario. And so I don't see marketing as a bad thing. I don't see it as a negative thing. I'm against coercion. So, but marketing is not coercion. Uh, anybody can participate. And I don't see any reason to collect more data than is necessary. But I also don't think that it's a moral imperative for me to run a website free of any scripts. I think that if I were in the privacy business, that's a smart thing to do because it's it's on brand. Um, that, that would be something, but I don't think that, I, I don't care if you use a script blocker or not. Um, I don't care what information you put. I just want to do my best to serve you with a good product and notify you about the things that are going to solve your problems. So it's, as I see it, it's not a black and white one or the other. I think it's on brand and a smart thing for people who have a privacy oriented brand to, avoid, again, have a clean website that doesn't track um, to do that stuff. But I, I think that going too far down, I, I, I'm not making up the, the example of the person who's being stalked as an idle example. There are people who need help. And one thing you can do as a marketer is try to get your solutions to those people in, in the right way. And so that's probably difficult for most privacy enthusiasts to want to do, to say, I'm going to go and buy targeted ads on Facebook. But I think that morally it's very defensible. And while I wouldn't say it's an imperative, to me it makes sense that you should try to market your products 
as effectively as possible to the people that you think you can serve the best. Here's the other thing. Profits are power. And this is where, why I'm also quite passionate about uh, marketing. Let me tell you about another experiment that I ran in the early days of radical personal finance. I had come from a very conflicted industry. Financial advisors in any of their permutations, in any of their business practices, face daily conflicts of interest. It is unavoidable. The conflicts of interest of should I tell you to buy this product that makes a higher commission than that product? Should I tell you to invest in my product when I know that in theory there are other products on the marketplace that might be better for you? Or do I tell you to invest in my, buy my product that is more expensive and there are other there are other products that are cheaper? And I may believe that my product is is better for you, but do I owe you a moral duty of telling you that there are other other products that are cheaper? Um, do I tell you to invest in my product to buy my mutual funds or do I tell you to pay off your mortgage? Do I tell you to buy my mutual funds or to start a business? Do it, it, it's, it's, it's inescapable. And some people try to get into it where they say, well, if I'm a fiduciary advisor instead of a, a sales agent, then that solves it. My experience, having practiced as both, it doesn't solve it. Uh, I don't think it solves the conflicts of interest. They're, they're interminable. And because it's an industry that is so fraught with real conflicts of interest and potential conflicts of interest, I grew very, very tired of it. And I just wanted to be free. I myself, when I left the financial advice industry, I said, I don't want to sell anything except my advice and my opinion. And so I had this, this um, moral goal to say, I'm going to be free of conflicts of interest. After years of dealing with that and wrestling with it and trying to find the way to do the right thing and, and in, in the midst of all those conflicts of interest and disclosure, all that stuff, I was like, I'm just going to be free of it. And it was a very arrogant thing where I thought, I'm just going to be free of it. And so my goal was to make all of my information available for free and then to rely exclusively on voluntary donations to me um, for the free information that I had already provided. I felt like that would free me from those conflicts of interest. And I pursued that for almost three years. Now, Thankfully, my audience recognized my desire to, to serve, and they rewarded me with signing up to do it. But at that time, the, 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 I forget the numbers now. It was a tiny percentage. Under, it was like 2%, 1% of my audience that would send me any money. And then those, that money that, that was there was quite small. And so I could live on it, but I wasn't getting rich on it. And I found myself constrained in my ability to serve. And so finally, and, and I, I tried to avoid advertising, by the way, for a long time. I, I just refused to take ads on my podcast. People would pitch me and I had six-figure, multi-six-figure ad revenue that was available to me. And I walked away from it after this like moral quest to be free of conflicts of interest. After a few years, I finally looked myself straight in the mirror and I said, Joshua, you're not helping anybody. You're being a fool. Because what happens is that lack of revenue was harming my ability to expand. And I was running around doing everything myself and I couldn't hire the staff that I needed. I couldn't expand like I needed because the lack of revenue didn't give it to me. And I, and I, couldn't, I couldn't buy traffic. I couldn't pay for anything because I didn't have enough listener support. And so I said, that's stupid. And I, did, and I cut the whole thing off. I, I ended, ended most of the listener support stuff. Um, I still have a minor listener support um, component of what I do, but it's, it's minor in, in terms of the overall revenue. And I started selling stuff. And as I started selling stuff, it transformed everything. And I started making a lot more money. And then with a lot more money, I could make a lot more impact and I could impact more people's lives because now I have the ability to develop new things that help my existing clients. And I have the ability to go out and do more things. And so profit is power and it, it empowers you to serve more people. So I look at profits and, and I had to change my mindset because I had some, some messed up thinking. But now I train myself and I remind myself that 
profits are an indication of excellent service. In a free market economy where people can make non-coerced transaction decisions to buy the things that they want to buy and to support the, 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 the things that they want to support, your best measurement of the impact that you have made in, in the world with your message and your products is simply the amount of profit that you have in the, the industry. And so that is your best metric to start with. If you and I Gabriel, want to impact people and help people buy Bitcoin privately to protect their privacy, then we need to measure our impact by how our, our best measurement of the impact we're making is the amount of profits. If we make $50,000, that's an indication that we've served X number of people. If we make $500,000 selling the information that we've compiled, that's an indication that we've served 10 times as many people. And if you want to empower people to get to, to have their control of their privacy, then the the measurement is to look at is profit. So how do you get that profit there? Well, now if we if we make fifty thousand um, dollars selling it based upon word of mouth and organic reach, et cetera, we can impact some people. But now if we go and we spend $100,000 buying ads, targeting people, and those people turn around and do it, we have a much bigger impact. And so I believe that it's a fallacy to think, as I once did, again, I learned this the hard way, I'm, I'm, I learned some lessons the hard way. It's a fallacy to sit back in your cave feeling morally superior to other people because I don't market, I don't, I don't advertise. And what you're actually doing is you're harming the people that you could have helped if you engaged in the best business practices of the day and reached them with your valuable message, your valuable information, your valuable motivation, your valuable content, and you sold them the things that you needed to do. And then in turning around and selling them, you now have revenue and profits that you can then invest into reaching more people. So it's a, it's a false belief to think that that is a morally superior position i've tried it and I, i'm saying that to myself i realized i was wrong and i decided to change and i'm still changing and that's why yeah, that's the argument for it well i see you feel very strongly about this and i think that is something that certainly needs to be said and so i appreciate you saying it especially in privacy circles you will see a lot of people who say that oh, I offer this for free because, and, and they seem to feel morally superior. And I would turn that on its head and say, if you are doing something for free, that is immoral because what you are doing is saying, what what is, what is a, a payment? A payment is a reward for doing something good. And that reward allows you to create more of it or to be in a posi better position to do it. So if you are undercutting yourself, uh, we could argue that that is an, an immoral thing to do. I've also noticed as regards marketing culture that it can be a way to show people some of the stuff that they're leaking out there's all these stories of people who they were talking to a friend in their room and they see this ad on facebook and they start to realize okay what's going on here and, and they kind of take the privacy path after that point or what i did in the past is i did some marketing of my i did some ads of my book on amazon and one of the things i did was my tagline for the ad was if you can read this ad you're probably not doing privacy correctly so um, it. It, it can be a way to uh, bring people's attention to this. And so you have a fabulous sub section of your podcast called Asset Protection Planning for Mere Mortals, a, a subgenre that really attracted me. I, th I think it has a lot of valuable information. Just give the audience a sense of what that was, what this multi-part series was about and how it can pertain to our privacy strategies. I love asset protection planning. And one of the things that's interesting about certain aspects of financial planning is people look at them as there, there are some areas of the industry that have a sleazy reputation. I don't know whether that reputation is well deserved or not, probably is, but it's probably not as well res deserved as people think it should be. And when we get to it, uh, things that I talk about a lot, like international diversification, offshore planning, people say, oh, it's tax evasion. Nonsense. That world is dead and gone. It's a matter of protecting you and your rights as a human being and your personal freedom. Similarly, with asset protection planning, people go and they say, uh, oh, asset protection planning is just for the rich guy who wants to go and commit dastardly deeds and then get taken apart. Nonsense. 
Asset protection planning is for us mere mortals, right? That's why I called it asset protection planning for mere mortals. You need to understand the law and you need to understand how it applies to you so that you can protect the people who are the most vulnerable. Let me give one example, right? I'm very passionate about reminding people that things like retirement accounts in the United States, most importantly, a 401k account, are completely exempt from the claims of your creditors, except the IRS or a divorcing spouse. They're exempt, okay? Again, except for those super creditors, like the IRS or a divorcing spouse, the money that's in your 401k account is exempt. And I can't tell you how many times I have fought to save somebody. For example, somebody has has had a medical um, emergency. And let's assume that the person had a serious medical condition, had major hospital care. Assume all the medical expenses are paid for. Even if you have the world's greatest government medical system where all the medical expenses are paid for, People who go through serious health emergencies and are very, are very vulnerable and they wind up in a bad financial situation oftentimes, right? They got no income. They can't work. They still have to live while they're trying to figure out how to get better. Better Often their expenses go up because they're trying to buy all kinds of pills or vitamins or drugs or treatments or specialists to, to fix their life, which is what they should do. And they often wind up in debt. And then the fact that they can't work means that they fall behind on their credit cards and now they start being harassed. And so they're being harassed by some guy who's calling them on the phone all the time, telling them, listen, you owe us money, you owe us money, you owe us money on a credit card, which they do. So what does that person do? Well, once they get the medical, the acute medical situation resolved, they want to go clean up their finances. And so what they often will do is say, well, I have my life savings over here. I have $100,000 in my 401k, and I'm going to go and I'm going to take it and I'm going to use it to pay for a credit card uh, company. And I just jump up and down and say, no, 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 no. Do not do that. Don't ever take money out of a creditor-protected account to pay off an unsecured creditor like a credit card company. You need that money. You need that money to be able to take care of you so you don't become a ward of the state, so you don't become indigent. You need that money. So keep it in that ironclad protected account that's called your 401k and then work separately with the credit card companies to earn money once you can get back to work and to renegotiate those debts and settle them as befits what you should properly do. And so asset protection planning is not something that relates to just, you know, the big fat cat up on the hill. It's everyday people. And so in asset protection planning, I first in that series deal with is it moral or legal to do asset protection planning? And there just very quickly because you need to settle it. It's simply this. You always have the right and the duty to settle your affairs properly. But asset protection planning and understanding the law that applies to you is so that you can avoid being swindled or taken advantage of when you're in a vulnerable situation. And so you need to always be in a strong situation so that you can do what's morally right rather than be in a weak situation and be abused by other people. Uh, and so in that series, I teach it. And interestingly, with privacy, privacy is a component of asset protection planning, and it's a very important component of it. Um, when we talk about asset protection planning, a significant portion of that has to do with good exemption planning, good bankruptcy planning, understanding that the role of, of, of what accounts to use and how to use them, uh, good insurance planning, et cetera. But at its core, having your affairs be private is a major protective force. And I'll just mention this in the context of a privacy uh, podcast so that, so that the privacy enthusiasts understand how valuable this is. If you are sued by a creditor and if the creditor wins the lawsuit against you, you must legally, when ordered by the court, disclose your assets, all of them. The penalties for not disclosing those when ordered by the court are too significant for you to run the risk of, of lying. Uh, the penalties involve prison. Right? You're being put in prison for lying. You don't. It's perjury. You don't do it. You don't lie to the court. However, there is a long road between some kind of event happening that causes somebody to want to sue you 
and you actually having to disclose all of your assets to the court and to the creditor. And you can dissuade many potential creditors and or negotiate more effectively with many potential creditors if your assets are not easily found. And so one reason for financial privacy is simply to protect you against this. If you are driving today and somebody runs into you, and by the way, this many times can be malicious and and clearly intended. Go on YouTube and spend a little time poking around and you'll find all kinds of people trying to run insurance scams, uh, uh, pretending they were hit by a car, etc. But if some event happens, even if you're responsible for the event, if you have a lot of publicly visible assets, you face a much higher risk of being sued for the event than if you don't. Why? Well, in the United States, and again, here I'm talking about the U.S. American system. In the United States, a person who has a claim will go and take that claim to an attorney. You see these ads everywhere. Injured in an accident? Call us. They take that claim to an attorney. Many times, the person who is trying to make the claim against you has no money to pay the attorney. The attorney will not work for free. So what will the attorney do? Well, first, the attorney will understand the actual facts of the case and will try to understand, do I actually have a case here that I think I can win? Is there a wrong that has been committed? Is some? Do I have a case that I think I can win? But that's only half the battle. The second half of the battle is, do I have somebody who has deep enough pockets for me to win the case? And that person needs to either have a good insurance policy and or a good uh, deep pockets. Now, this is not a reason to skimp on insurance. Your best, most important protection against uh, lawsuits is to have proper insurance. And so you should have good insurance. And the wealthier you are, the more insurance you should have. But that attorney will do an asset search uh, or have uh, an investigator do an asset search. And I can give you the book, the handbook. I have the handbook on how to do financial asset investigations. I can tell you all of the ways that the investigator will dig into the case to try to find out what assets you have. Most of the time, these are legal means. For example, let's go to the local property um, appraiser's website or the local tax records and see how many pieces of property does this person own? Uh, what, what publicly available property is this? In some cases, and I don't think this is prevalent. I just know that it has happened in the past. In some cases, the asset investigation will use illegal means, right? The investigator will bribe somebody at a large bank to tell you them the bank account balance or the, the uh, uh, investment account balance of the individual. Uh, again, I don't think that's widespread, but it has happened many times. And so, once they come back, if they can come back and say, hey, this guy over here, he's got millions of dollars and the millions of dollars are not protected, we can get at it, then there's a much higher chance that the lawyer will accept the case and start the legal process of suing you, knowing that if he can win, he can collect on your assets. On the other hand, if the asset search comes back and shows that this individual actually has no money, this individual has no property, or this individual has no money or no property that we can seize because it is protected, it's exempt, or some other has some other legal protection against it, then there's a good chance that that lawyer simply tells the potential client, yeah, I'm not going to take the case. And so you can dramatically minimize your risk. In addition, let's say that you actually do, that the attorney takes the case, you wind up sued, and now you're going to court. Your goal is to not go to court. Your goal is to settle the case in some way that resolves your moral responsibility. If you were if you were wrong in the event, then you owe it to the person to settle your moral responsibility. You need to compensate somebody that you have wronged, and you need to make that person whole. That is your moral duty. Um, but that number needs to be something that reflects reality. And so your goal, even in working through the lawsuit, is to settle the case before it goes to court and or find some kind of agreement before the case is ruled on. All during that time, if your assets are privately held, you have no legal duty to disclose that information and it puts you in a much stronger negotiating position. 
you might live in a house that the person can see that, that hey, this guy lives in a $500,000 house or a million dollar house or whatever. Great. But you might have that house value covered by the exemption laws of your state. You might also have a 401k that's got a million dollars in it. Nobody needs to know the fact that you also have $10 million of other property. And the fact that the, the person suing you, the claimant, thinks that you have a maximum capacity of $2 million or, or, or the fact that you have a couple hundred thousand dollars, they'll settle the case for perhaps a realistic number of $200,000, in which case if you owe the person because you've wronged somebody, then pull out your checkbook and write them the case, write the check for $200,000. On the other hand, if your $10 million of property is visible, then there's a good chance that they're not going to settle for the $200,000 and they're going to fight for some outrageous claim that you might wind up losing. So privacy is a major component of good asset protection planning. Privacy in and of itself is not sufficient. If you go to court, if you lose your suit, then at that point in time, the, uh, the, 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 the person that you've lost to can order a, a creditor, a judgment credit, they can get a, take a judgment, uh, what's it called? I've lost the name of it. But they can order a judgment, a, a debtor report where they can order you to disclose your assets. And the court can order that. And that's the time at which you actually need to disclose, yes, I have $10 million of other assets. That is the case where then you wind up doing more sophisticated uh, asset protection planning. And you seek to impose legal restrictions that will limit the ability of your creditor to make that claim against you. But understanding this and knowing this is very, very important. And it's important for you to arm yourself with the information because you don't know. I think that one of the things that's changed over the last few years is there have been many times in the past where I've talked to people who just assumed that they were going to get a fair shake in court. They assume that the courts are just, the jury will find what, what, what needs to be found, et cetera. I don't think really anybody has that illusion anymore. Uh, going to court is pretty much a crapshoot in the United States that you may or may not get justice, but we're not really sure. And so you need to protect yourself with uh, good asset protection planning, understanding the laws, and then also privacy uh, is a major component of that. Uh, so it is an important topic, and it's a, po it's a point where privacy very much is useful and important. Yes, and I would encourage anybody who is interested by what Josh just said Track down the asset protection planning for mere mortals. I will have a link in the video description. Final question here, Joshua. Thanks so much for being with us and sharing this information. Are there any interesting or unusual privacy techniques that you have used in your own life? Uh, you live a life that is a little bit more interesting than, than most. You traveled and lived abroad. You are a public figure. You expect me to tell you about my private, interesting privacy strategies? Uh -huh. <laughs> I guess the answer I would give to that, to that I'm happy to disclose, is I think the most interesting privacy strategy that I engage in is simply the use of international diversification. And I'll be the first to line up and say that international relocation or internationalization is not for it's certainly not for everyone and i would i would go a step farther and say i would say it's not for most people um that uh, I, I would guess that many, much of your audience is based in the united states i don't think that most americans would be happy relocating abroad in fact the years that i've now spent outside the united states have have more than anything increased my appreciation for the many good things about the united states however in the world of privacy International diversification actually solves elegantly a number of, of problems. First, it can solve significant problems related to your location. In the United States, for you to have a private home, a private address, can actually be quite complex. But if you go abroad, in some countries, not in all, some countries are, are very opposed to privacy. In fact, you have major privacy leakages. But many times you go abroad, having a private address is simpler than it is. In some ways, it, it makes me think of maybe how the United States was in the 1970s or 1980s. Uh, I have had a, a hobby of reading old privacy books. I remember I read all the editions of J.J. Luna's book. Um, 
forgot his, the name of it, but I read the first edition, the second edition, the third edition, and the fourth edition. And what was interesting to me about reading all those old editions was how much things have changed. It was vastly easier to be private when he first started writing those books. And I read all of Boston Tea Party's old privacy manuals. And when he first started publishing those books, then the, the techniques were so much simpler than they are today. There are some things that are easier today, right? Um, communications privacy is much better today than it was back then. You, you read some of those old techniques and you laugh. Uh, things, and it was, it were legitimately difficult, right? You needed a landline and that landline was a major privacy leakage and yet you needed it. And so figuring out how to have a phone that was private back then was a lot harder than it is today to be able to be contacted. So it's not all bad, but where it has been very difficult in the United States has been mail privacy in terms of how to receive mail privately and on address privacy. And due to the proliferation of information across the internet, it has become difficult to do that. Well, you go abroad and a lot of times that's a really easy thing to solve. And it feels in some ways like basically the United States, say in the 1970s, when you could have a mail drop anywhere and you could rent a, a mail. Anyway, I won't go into it, but it was pretty, pretty easy. And, and, it it also cuts off a lot of your threats. The reason that the United States privacy is so important in the United States is simply that you have a lot of threats. Leaving the country can dramatically minimize some of those threats. Why do people care about privacy um, other than, than what are the practical reasons, right? Well, one practical reason might be something like what we just talked about, lawsuits. Well, that that phenomenon of lawsuits and living in a litigious culture, that is a unique danger in the United States that really is much, much different on a global basis. And so uh, you can just cut out the risk entirely and you right, go to, go to Italy, buy yourself a little villa that you live in that you're totally happy in. Your risk of lawsuits on a daily basis is vastly lower than the United States. And so you could take no privacy measures in that scenario, and yet your risks are much, much lower because you don't have that same litigation risk that you face in the U.S., uh, I think there are many other areas uh, that this is really interesting and works very well. Uh, again, it's easy to keep your address private when it comes to financial privacy. Many times you can uh, engage in financial privacy really effectively on an international basis. Uh, the example I use, I use frequently my U.S.-based uh, my U.S.-based uh, cards while I travel. Now, if I'm in the United States and I'm using my US-based credit cards, then of course there's a marketing profile that is being created on me. So there's that range of privacy. But I face a significant risk that if some, if I offend some law in some way unknown to me, then all that's needed to gain access to all of my private records, my transaction records, is a warrant. Uh, a a police investigator or a government investigator of some kind can obtain a warrant, can gain access to all my private records. But it's most likely that that warrant would be created due to some activity that I have done in the United States, right? I've broken one of the, I've, they finally caught on to one of the three felonies that you and I commit on a daily basis unknowingly um, because of the crazy laws that exist in the United States. But what's interesting is if I don't live in the United States, then there's a decent chance that, number one, I'm breaking fewer laws in the United States because many countries around the world don't have the crazy legal structure that the U.S. has, where, again, the experts estimate that all of us commit on average about three felonies a day. We just don't know what they are. Uh, no one knows what they are because no one knows how many laws there are out there, and it's only when the, the spotlight is shined on us that they actually come into play. So I can be in a place that has fewer laws and... In addition, let's say that I am under investigation for something, right? Somebody's alleging that I've actually done something. Well, now the investigator in that country has a harder time gaining access to my private financial records. Uh, if I'm in Mexico and I'm accused of something, the Mexican authorities will have to go and create an international agreement to dig into my financial records in the United States. That means that they're gonna, there's going to need to be a significant level of, of criminality, um, right? I'm going to need to have done something pretty bad. And for me, this is simply not a concern. I don't, I don't commit crimes knowingly, meaning I don't murder anybody. I don't cheat anybody. I don't commit 
I don't commit, do anything that's morally wrong against other people. Um, and so that's not a concern of mine. My concern in the United States is that because there's so many laws on the books, that I'm just doing things on a daily basis without knowing them, that when the light gets shined on me, I, oh, you've committed some crime, you've lied to an investigator, done some some of the other, you know, you've, you've bought rockfish and it's Ill, it's against the law for you to own rockfish or whatever that is. And those are the kinds of things that in a in a polarized country I'm concerned about. So the point is that using uh, an offshore uh, using international diversification, having my banks in in two countries buys me a significant amount of privacy. So I would argue that this is something that is under under discussed in the privacy community in the United States. That in, if you want the convenience of a credit card, just go and get a credit card from a credit card issuer in another country. Go and open a bank account in another country. Go to Canada, open a bank account, right? Go to Singapore. What happens is you're in the same way that all my U.S. cards work no matter where I am in the world. Your Canadian bank account, your Canadian ATM card will work just as well in the United States as it will in Canada. And yet now you have an international protection, a layer of privacy. And so while depending on what kind of international bank account you have, you may or may not want to have a daily account that you that you do five transactions a day you can use that to gain you significant levels of privacy. So here, I think this is the the modern adaptation of some of the old techniques, right? Again, JJ Luna, I like I like Luna. Um, Luna was a, was a treasure, right? And he had all these old books. Um, I have all his books, and he would talk about going to a, a far flung state and opening an, a bank account in a far flung state, right? If you live in Florida, go to Washington. If you live in California, go to Maine and open an account with a local bank. And that's good. I think that's a smart move. But it's way better to go and open a bank account in Canada than it is in Maine, because now if that investigator is trying to find your uh, your assets then now there's an international component. And where do I even start, right? Is, is the bank account in Canada? Is it in the Cayman Islands? Is it in the Bahamas? Is it in Singapore? Is it in London? Is it in Switzerland? Is it in Jamaica? Like, who knows? And so that, I think, is is the, the least discussed thing in the privacy community. And you can use internationalization to solve a lot of these issues. Let me give a few more examples. Uh, one of the areas where the U.S. really shines is in the fact that it's relatively easy to get um, private communications devices that aren't linked to your government identification. In some countries, this is simply illegal. Um, some countries you can go in, you pop in, grab a SIM card, boom, you're on the road. Uh, but in other countries, it's it's not legal at all. You have to give your passport for any phone number. You can't go and pick up a prepaid card. You have to give your legal government ID, and it has to be registered with the local equivalent of a social security number. And so, again, same thing is that somebody in that context, by simply going to a country nearby, can uh, can gain more communications privacy. Now, that's not perfect, right, because your IMEI and everything is clearly going to be foreign. But there are ways that you can look, depending on the specific threats that you're trying to protect against, you can use other countries as ways of protecting yourself systematically. So I'm a big enthusiast of that, and I found that uh, offshore diversification and that simply, and again, I'm a big proponent of flag theory, of using each country for what it's best at is a major solve some of the big privacy problems effectively for many people, not for all people, but for many people. This has been excellent. This has been Joshua Sheed's greatest hits, but I get to direct it and, and have him discuss what I want him to talk about. So this has been fabulous. Thank you, Joshua. And let's end by having people know where they can go to make use of your services or where they can find out more about you. Of course, we have co-produced the Bitcoin Privacy Course, bitcoinprivacycourse.com. I'm easy to find radical personal finance available wherever you listen to podcasts, um, increasingly coming in other formats as well. But my where I want people to do is actually go to bitcoinprivacycourse.com. And that's clearly because Gabriel and I can make a few bucks. But what I, I want to do it for ideological reasons. And here is one appeal that I would make in the privacy community. If you want privacy to be enhanced, you need to make more public arguments 
as to why people should embrace privacy. It's not for all people. I it, I understand and appreciate the guy who says, I'm just going to be a nobody. I'm going to be invisible. That's very attractive. But at the end of the day, I would rather live in a culture of people who respect privacy versus being the one guy who's invisible in a culture that doesn't respect privacy. And we are at a crossroads right now where we can genuinely make the world better for our children and grandchildren by dismantling some of the major systems of control that others have foisted onto us. One of those systems has been money. One of those systems has been financial control. And so I want you to go to bitcoinprivacycourse.com and learn how to use Bitcoin because you can own the Bitcoin privately. But even Gabriel and I debated live during that course. I don't think you should be a super you know, secret squirrel around the fact of using Bitcoin. Encourage people to use Bitcoin. Encourage it. And that's one thing where I think we can we can make a difference is I want you to have private Bitcoin and to use it. But my biggest reason for that is so that we can get more and more people using it. Because even if Bitcoin itself is not private, which it's not, unless it's gotten right, right? Bitcoin is in many ways more public than your credit card transactions are. We can encourage a world that will be better in this area. And this is one of those way. This is one of those areas where we can do it. And so that would be my preference is go and learn how to use Bitcoin. If you don't own Bitcoin, uh, go and get some. Uh, and I'm a big proponent of if there's something that you're interested in, don't sit around waiting on it. I made that mistake for years. If I had gotten involved, if I had bought my first Bitcoin years before I did, I would have bought a whole lot more before I did. And I would be a whole lot richer today because of it. Uh, but go and get involved in the Bitcoin space more than just radical personal finance, because that I think is one of the, the that is the current cutting edge, the frontier where we can genuinely roll back um, the forces of tyranny and we can encourage liberty, freedom, free exchange of individuals. And that's a fundamental good thing to do um, as freely and peacefully. It is a revolution that is happening right now. And that's a revolution that I want to be part of and I want to encourage because it reflects the values that I care about, not coercion, but free, independent choices of individuals who choose to transact with others in peaceful, non-coercive relationships. So that would be my preference. Go to BitcoinPrivacyCourse.com, take our course and start getting involved in the Bitcoin community as one component of your overall privacy strategy. the ones like you who work tirelessly to keep things running everything would suddenly stop hospitals factories schools and power plants they all depend on you no matter the weather emergency or time of day you're the ones who get it done at granger we're here for you with professional grade industrial supplies count on real-time product availability and fast delivery call click or just stop by granger for the ones who get it done